Hey. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Farhad Amin and I'm the author of the popular book Smart Single Muslimer. And on this channel, I provide Islamic solutions to the challenges Muslim women face. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Smart Muslimer podcast. My name is Farhad Amin, I'm your host. Have you subscribed? It only takes a minute and if you do, you'll never miss an episode again. Love the podcast? Well, please leave a review on whichever platform you are listening on and why not share it on WhatsApp or Instagram? My handle is farhatameen underscore UK. So please go ahead and follow me and share it with your friends, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. You're listening to the Nikabi Dari series by the pen, the sound of sisters raising their voices with the written word. I'm your host, Samar, and thank you for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode of By the Pen. Alhamdulillah, we have with us a return author. Alhamdulillah, last time I spoke with her about her single Muslim book, and inshallah today she'll be talking about some of her recent books that she's released and her latest book, inshallah. I'll let her introduce herself, inshallah. This is Sister Farhat Amin. So could you please introduce yourself for the listeners and tell us a little bit about what you do, inshallah. Oh, assalamu alaikum. Uh, summer for having me on again. Um, it's always a pleasure. Um, yeah, so my latest book is called Smart Teenage Muslimer, and it's really there to provide an alternative to um, teenage Muslim girls, an alternative to like the really um, un-Islamic ideas that are pushed to them and they're encouraged to um, adopt. So things like being very promiscuous um sexualizing yourself and then also ideas such as being um secular the idea of you know islam should not take be a large take a role large role in your life or be something that you would want to follow that's something that i think um a lot of teenagers they're encouraged i think generally teenagers um muslim or non-muslim are encouraged to you know embrace those ideas but what we find is that inevitably, if you're living in an environment, and I think it's global, really, in the East and the West, where that as a teenager, you, those are the ideas that you are um, being encouraged through popular culture to adopt. It's inevitable that our girls and daughters and nieces and cousins, they are adopting that. So I wanted the purpose of the book was to provide show that there is an alternative to that lifestyle. Fantastic, mashallah. I think that's definitely really important and I can absolutely relate having a teenage daughter myself, alhamdulillah. I'm sure a lot of parents would, um, you know, you know, would need this kind of advice and encouragement to help their their daughters and even sons as well. I'm, I'm sure that's something you've probably thought about too. So uh, what would you say at the moment was, you know, your inspiration to actually start writing this book? Well, I've been interested in this subject as a high school teacher I taught in girl only schools and in, in, in one school in particular, there were, it was majority Muslim girls at that school. And I was having, when I compared my own teenagers to what they were going through and just how different things had become. So just as an example, the idea that you need to have a boyfriend, it was, it's the norm now that even if they weren't going to do it, because as Muslim, Alhamdulillah, the really good thing about Muslims is that we're still adhering to many rules. And a lot of the girls, I found that uh, they weren't, they didn't have boyfriends, but there was this dream that, you know, and this mirage of, yes, if I had a boyfriend, I would be happier and I would be, you know, I'd have someone to love me and someone who would buy me gifts and someone who would be showing me attention. And that was like a something they were aspiring to have but they weren't doing it because they were muslim and um and the thing is that you not only have that in you know like we grew up and, and you see it now on netflix every single teenage movie the 
girl has to have a boyfriend. She's either trying to get a boyfriend or she's trying to change the way she looks so she can get a boyfriend. Or the other thing that you now have is being a lesbian is fine as well, that you can, that's become normalized. You know, there's um, there's a very famous um, book, um, not book, it's a, it's a movie call. Um, um, it's regarding who came, look who's come for dinner. I, I've forgotten the exact title, but it, it, this was in, made in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And it was, and the whole premise was that there's an um, American um, white woman who she then has um, a boyfriend who's, um, um, black who's you know um but this is set, set in america and she brings him to dinner for christmas and then there's a big uproar because the parents are shocked and now there's a new modern version of that and but this time instead of it being um a black man who now is, is, is supposedly racism uh is 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 less in america which it, as we know it isn't she then has a lesbian girlfriend and so that's just one example if, as things are moving on for Muslim or non-Muslim, they're the ideas that are being normalised and encouraged. And what we need to realise is our girls are not immune from that um, influence. And we can either, as parents, we can either bury our heads in the sand and think, oh no, our girls, my daughters aren't going to do anything like that. Or they're not affected, they're Muslim. So as if that's some kind of force field, just being a Muslim Mm. will protect you. And unfortunately, it's not. We, as parents, we we do have to do more. And and the purpose of my book is not to like scaremonger and put fear into parents so they will buy my book. That is definitely that that's not something I do. It's more to when we can see there's a problem, we need to understand it and then find out. Okay, what's the Islamic solution to this, and how can I help my daughter or my niece or my sister? Uh, and that's what I'm hoping to achieve, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah, subhanAllah. Yeah, because I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you've included this topic particularly in your book as well, but there's also the other issue of the trend, uh, um, the quick rise actually of the K-pop industry as well, because that's influencing a lot of um, young, you know, Muslims too. Is something that I've seen recently. I mean, obviously when we was in school, there was, you know, different boy bands and things like that. So it's like, you know, this is something that I, I see a lot of girls they're getting interested in now as well, and that kind of pushes um, pushes along with these same ideas that you've mentioned. You know about you know young girls needing to have a boyfriend and things like that, and obviously the then the whole alphabet community issue as well is also another big deal too, and another big challenge for a lot of Muslim parents now as well, which some are unfortunately extremely unaware that you know, this is happening in probably even in their own homes with the internet and things like that. You don't know, sometimes you don't have any any control of what your children are, um, are really even doing, um, you know, if, as much as you would like. Um, a lot of parents do let their children, teenagers especially, have mobile phones and things like that. Whereas, in you know, in the past, it was as easy as our parents telling us, well, you know, I don't want you going here and I don't want you going there, you're going to stay in the house. But now it's like your child could be in the house all the time. And they could be involved in all sorts of fahisha that, you know, you know, beyond your imagination, you know, you wouldn't even realize unless you were literally on top of them monitoring everything that they get up to online as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. It's and I think that what's important is how do we react to what is happening in wider society? That's the question that we need to as Muslims, we need to think about that. It's it's not going to go away. If if anything, it's it's getting worse because if we look historically, things are like you said, the shamelessness um, from the nineteen sixty sexual revolution to now, it has it, it's it, it gets worse. As non-Muslims, when you are following your desires, but in particular, if we um, okay, not all non-Muslims are bad. So let's say be more specific. So when very liberal must um people so someone who's liberal who they believe in individual freedom they believe in individualism that i can do whatever makes me happy as long as i am not harming anyone else that that's that's like the philosophy behind it and so but what they ignore is that when for example okay so they decide to okay they're having they have a boyfriend and then they are um they have multiple partners and so you're ignoring okay we can see that there's the stds that happen because if a person chooses to 
um, not protect themselves whilst they're having relationship that mm-hmm. can cause STDs. But there's also the emotional, um, you know, this idea of having a boyfriend and then you break up and then somehow as if mentally it's not going to affect you, you then just go and get another boyfriend mm-hmm. and then you have a physical relationship with them and then you they break up with you. And then you, because that's the cycle that they're encouraging. That is not good for men or women's mm-hmm. mental health mm-hmm. at all to, to ignore that, you know, and they're ignoring that as if somehow you're just, it's all fun. When actually it's not fun because girls in particular, they get very, women get very emotionally connected when they have a relationship and, um, and this is based on studies and men may just they'll have the physical relationship well let's talk about teenage boys they will have the physical relationship and they're quite happy to uh, they don't connect as much now so just taking the women because that could relate to men and women but just taking a young um inexperienced you know 15 year old who th- this is what she's being encouraged by the movies and the books that she's reading well and the shows and her friends as well and celebrities everyone is telling her you should do this but then when she does do this it has an effect on her um her self-esteem you know it has you know does she start thinking well if I want to keep the boyfriend do I need to agree to things that he's saying which are physically whether it's you know doing things in bed that she doesn't want to even just sleep she may not want to mm. sleep with a guy and I think a lot of Muslim girls they don't want to do that they might just be looking for companionship um, but then they think, oh, if I, I, to keep him, I have to do this, or to keep him, I have to dress more provocatively, or to keep or to get a boyfriend, I need to change the way I look. I have to sexualize myself, because that's what's so. If you sexualize yourself, you are more popular. Yes. And all of it. Uh, and this is one of the premises of my book that when let's look at this lifestyle and these ideas, and let's see, are they good for your mental health? Are they good for your well being? And then also, are they good for your akhira? And on all counts, it's a no for all of them. So that, inshallah, I think it's, I, I think our, our girls are very intelligent and they just, there just aren't enough voices giving the Islamic alternative and, crit- and critiquing and questioning that lifestyle that they're being told to adopt, that this somehow you have to be, ext- you know, um, this beauty myth of being very thin, you know, very skinny, mm-hmm. Um, being very you know as it uh, again it's a very you know we all got a picture in our mind of whether it's um you know um I forgot I I don't pronounce the name Zaydana is it um the girl for the actress from um oh goodness me from Spider-Man it's a something yeah I I know who you're talking about but I I can't I don't know her name I can't pronounce it it's really bad uh, but certain actresses at the moment are really being um um pushed you know whether it's uh you know okay Beyonce is she's too old now and so is um uh the other woman I've forgotten her I'm, I'm really bad things I don't keep up with celebrities this is why I can't exactly, think of the names exactly. but I think in anyone yeah anyone listening to this will know there are certain faces and a certain the Kardashians for example a certain body image you know a certain lifestyle um that is encouraged to w- women and young girls in particular and the whole uh, this is why I, I felt I had to write this, this book was because there wasn't uh, there was no other book like this out there uh, and I'm not saying this is a selling point I'm saying this is a genuine um I, I when I wrote smart single Muslim I had some mums contacting me and saying do you have something for younger girls yes and I was thinking oh there must be something out there for young for teenage mm. girls there's so much there's so much and again, what you have, Alhamdulillah, you you will have. So, for example, I, I speak. I've written a, a hot, very long chapter on puberty. Yeah. So you will have um, the thick of puberty books, which is a- absolutely brilliant. We need that. Mm-hmm. You'll have books about, um, you know, um, sexual ethics in Islam. Mm-hmm. Um, you will have that, um, but you won't have. Uh, it's it's they're not covering modern twenty first century ch- challenges that, that girls are going. Through. That, that's the issue. So, and, and I don't don't think a young girl would read the thick of puberty, unfortunately. Um, but what I am co- in the book, I do then inc- I'll discuss everything related to puberty. But then I do encourage them that you need, need to learn about, you know, based on the school of thought your family uh, follows, you then need to find, learn the details. Yes. But this is the thing that I think we, uh, I think as Muslims, we need to address um, 
the, the current issues that are happening. So again, I have a whole chapter on gender identity and, um, you know, LGBTQIA, because that is what is being um, taught in college, in schools exactly. and then, and via popular culture. Yeah, definitely. It's fun. It's good that you mentioned about your previous book, actually, because I had, I myself had bought Smart Single Muslim and not for myself, but actually for my daughter. So, um, you know, and like, cause you know, she's nearing her twenties, but I was thinking this would be a good book for her. And I like, I bought the book and I thought I'm going to read it first. <laughs> so, cause I just wanted to know like, <laughs> what does this book cover and, you know, is it hitting all the spots? And for me, I thought it was definitely like a really, really good book, but, um, you know, I can understand obviously why other parents reached out because obviously there's definitely uh, so many issues, like you mentioned that are really kind of plaguing the you know the lives of young muslim women and the problem as well is that a lot of them don't see it as a plague they see it as that's their normal life now when they're going to school and things like that you know their friends are engaged in these things it could be other muslim girls it could be um you know friends that they have that are not muslim as well obviously so and you know i i found personally that you know there's multiple issues um, even within the school system itself, when our children are mixing in schools, um, even if it's a madrasa, for example, because, you know, sometimes, you know, you hear parents saying, oh, well, you know, don't copy, um, you know, this kid because they're not Muslim, um, you know, or this person is doing this thing because they're not Muslim. And I've heard a lot of parents explain away certain behaviours based on the fact that somebody's not Muslim. But the reality is we do have Muslims in the community who are less practicing or maybe not practicing Islam at all. And their children may be involved in certain things which are um, not correct. And even from practicing families as well, we shouldn't you know, think too much of ourselves if we are practicing Islam you know, properly that, um, or to the best of our ability that our, our children are not you know, basically getting involved in certain things which are completely haram because it happens. I've met young girls who unfortunately have fallen into even getting pregnant and having abortions without the knowledge of their parents, you know, the Muslim girls who are wearing hijab. And, you know, so these are some of the issues that are happening under their under their own parents' you know eyes, but without the parents realizing that this is what the daughter's actually going through. So it's almost like you in one household you can have, you know, it's like they're living parallel lives. You know, it's like two different universes, but in like one house. You know, so it's it's good you've written this book because I think there needs to be a connection for the parents to like you know come to where the point where the children the young girls are especially and you know meet them at their reality and the things that they are facing mm, yeah that, that is so true it's I think uh, sometimes parents can they just think of their own upbringing and they think that their children will be doing the same as them exactly. and it's partly it's not their it's you know if you don't make an effort to find out what is going on in your teenage child's life they will then you know that they'll just hide it from you or think or they or they may think if i tell them anything you're just going to get sh shouted at or i'm going to get told off and then they won't tell you anything and then who are they then going to advise for because at school the the school system will be very they will open their arms up to any child who says that my parents are too strict religiously too strict yeah, exactly. you know and they will they will get so much love and empathy and advice that is all un-islamic in that they'll say yeah you should be able to choose what you want to do you don't need to you know you've got your own journey to go through you don't have to follow what your parents say so this is what muslim parents are up against and we need to wake up to this and the thing is it's not easy I I completely understand because my my children are now older but having gone through that it's not an easy task to be a parent exactly. who wants their child to obey Allah to love Allah to follow his rules but if we want to get Jannah you know paradise is at the mother's feet but it's that does also include effort and that's the and this is that if, if this uncomfortable feeling that we're going to get when we find out that our children are doing certain things or having to talk to them about. So, for example, I, I have a chapter on Islamic sex education mm -hmm. because there is so little of it out there for 
young teenagers and the point is if we're not going to teach them we can't say oh we don't want the school to teach them but we're not going to bother teaching them ourselves so where are they going to learn they're going to learn it from school and they're going to learn it from shows like sex education on netflix or Mm -hmm. every other show on netflix to be honest Mm -hmm. um so but we have to do it and and i thought okay if i i'll just i'll write all everything about puberty and sex education so if a parent doesn't feel they've got the tools to do it or it's just give them my book and read it and then you can then talk to them after that um but let's this is what again that's another thing and that was the most I left that chapter to the last yes because I was I didn't want to write it even I was thinking oh man I just oh I'm gonna and I had to read so much and um uh, it took a very long time and it's not nice Mm. who wants to write about that but it's so necessary um so I really like and I turned that chapter into a course because I thought okay if some people prefer to have it read said to them and then add more details to it and I thought at least you know because one of the things that I found is that it's e- complaining about the problem is so easy you know I could uh, I could sit for hours and but I thought make providing a solution is harder mm-hmm. but let's start providing solutions for the ummah you know um and that if someone then asks me I can say look do the course read the book yeah this will help you inshallah and I wish I'd had it when I was um when my kids were teenagers okay so um where is your book available sister oh okay so you can buy it from Amazon and um that's that's where where you can get a paperback from you can get the ebook from google play books right and so that's internationally um, that's most countries I will be, um, and then you can also go to smartmuslima.com mm-hmm. and um, that's where I'll be then putting the links for once. It's, for example, uh, the Kindle, that should be available soon. But again, I still know that um, not everyone can, Amazon doesn't publish, send everywhere. It should be available on Book Depository soon as well. Right. So they're the three places. Inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. So, um, what would you say um has been your biggest challenge while writing this book in particular? I think it was to, uh, to to stop <laughs> to stop writing as to stop adding chapters because mm. there were so many. Like for example, there were so many areas that I could have talked about, but I thought I have to be realistic as far as if I if a, a teenager is given a book the size of an encyclopedia, they're not going to read it. Yes, and um. Yeah. So I thought, and I have to, there are certain, for example, I didn't include a chapter on social media addiction and, you know, just general um, mobile phone use, smartphones, because I was thinking they probably hear that a lot, that, Mm. oh, get off your phone, don't be on your phone Mm. so much. But the thing is that nowadays, so much is online as far as, I'm just thinking, you know, whether it's education, schools have, they tell you to go online to do your work, to do research. And a lot of people, since COVID, people's, you know, your friendships are, are mainly on there. So I didn't dedicate a whole chapter to that. What I did do throughout, you know, uh, the, ch- the chapters, I was in, encu- I have encouraged to think about how they use it, you know, who they follow, how much of an effect it's having on them. You know, I provided um, statistics regarding studies about the connection between uh, especially, especially for young um, girls, depression and um, self-esteem and, you know, how they view their body image and the connection that has to the amount of time they spend online. So it would have eased, because I thought it's, I think it's gone, once you're a teenager, it's very easy to, you know, have a phone and your parents won't even know about it, or you could be at college or school and you can be online. And so I thought that fight with trying to get them off their phone is kind of lost but how encourage them to because soon they'll be you know they'll be adults complete you know, like properly mature adults and they need to then think learn for themselves how am I going to manage my usage where it's not make I'm not so dependent on it I think that's the thing that and if I am on it am I uh, there's a positive way to use you know m- my device and devices so that for example so that was a challenge to you know even like for example you mentioned the k-pop again that could have been the whole um boy band culture and 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 that could have been a chapter as well but i thought i'm just 
yeah I thought I'm just going to keep it I've tried to keep it to the essentials Mm -hmm. and um yeah so for example I did include a chapter on Muslim misrepresentation Mm -hmm. specifically of young Muslim women because I think that is very um important because how they the image that it's it's so interesting the the characters in tv shows and movies um there seems to be in particular like we know that muslim men are portrayed as being violent you know controlling um backward you know misogynistic that's like but then for young women it's it's again they're encouraging them to embrace you know a bit of freedom like take off your hijab you know be very be an ally to lgbtq uh you know be rebellious you know it's so interesting and what i provided was like i just did like five short case studies to prove my point and it was so easy to prove the point because i thought wow this isn't by coincidence yes, that every single show is that an idea and that's what girl and so if that's the only muslim teenager you're seeing it's um you can then think oh yeah wow I'm being represented but uh what I want us all to think about as well actually is that the representation we really want what's the agenda behind this um so yeah so alhamdulillah I was happy to the challenge was to finish and just editing takes a, a formatting takes that's the boring bit I, yes, I must yes. admit I find that very yes, it is definitely <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah but alhamdulillah thank Allah I was able to my health was good enough to to complete it and um yeah alhamdulillah I'm I'm I I feel like quite um proud of what I've done inshallah may Allah accept my efforts um so yeah so alhamdulillah that was the it, that was the challenge alhamdulillah so um and who would you say have been your biggest supporters during the course of writing this book um well, alhamdulillah, I think, um, well, it's interesting. When I first started to put the idea on my social media, I was, I was, you know, you can think something's a good idea, uh, but you really don't know. You think, you know, it could be a complete flop. But when people like, so alhamdulillah, people, sisters in particular online, on, on Instagram, they were very positive. They made me think, okay, yeah, this is good. And then on Twitter, alhamdulillah, a lot of um, fathers um they really said yeah this would because I I do think there was such like an attack on Muslim on the role of Muslim fathers and they were saying yeah there uh there isn't a lot out there so alhamdulillah and and what uh, and I've already like the bookshops that were stocking my previous books um they then they they straight away without even seeing a copy they said yeah we want to place an order and I said are you sure you haven't even read it and they said no we trust your you know we read your previous book and we trust you and I was like like that was a very I thought oh that's um that's I'm gonna write this then I'm gonna make sure that helped me to write it quicker Mm -hmm. as well because I thought if they Mm -hmm. feel you know and, and then what they also said was that there is there we don't have any book like this and it, we know parents um, would really like this. I think one of the reasons why a book like this doesn't exist is I do cover so-called controversial subjects. Mm-hmm. They actually aren't controversial, you know, sex education, um, gender identity, but they, uh, for some reason, um, m- m- not many Muslim writers are tackling it. And I don't know whether they think they will be criticised or... And the point is, I've... When I was reading books by non-Muslims on this subject, who they may still be okay, they are still liberal, but they can they disagree. They can see the problems that you know sexualization or um, trans, you know, the whole um, idea of transitioning teenagers transitioning. But to be honest, even um, a lot of the trans activism. they can their point and even the sex there's a really good book about the problems of sexual revolution so they're writing books questioning this and I thought well if they're doing it then Muslims we haven't even they don't even have an alternative to these things but we do so it's important that we should also discuss these and provide the Islamic alternative so that not just for Muslims but also for non-Muslims so so although I'm focusing on uh the situation that Muslim girls face 
in particular if we look at teenagers because if I I'm thinking back to when I was um, a high school teacher that I was so surprised by how uh, if, if I looked at the, the my teenage students who much like they were really they were really nice girls but <laughs> many of them they um I remember this one time I went into a classroom and the girls were there at lunchtime and they were if you looked at them you'd think they, how are they they're just so so provocatively they're wearing loads of makeup their head they were all they were doing their hair and makeup and they were wearing very, really short skirts and their blouses were kind of open and these were only like 13 14 year olds and then I was just getting on with my putting some stuff up and then I just started to talk to them and then they were really sweet lovely girls and they were putting lots of hairspray in their hair and you know when you, you brush it back brush it and then I was just said to them I go you know that's really bad for your hair and um they were like yeah I know and, and I said you know that amount of hairspray it's gonna kill your roots and then we got talking but what they they just felt they had to look that they, way if they wanted to be popular if they wanted boys to like them and if they just wanted to be you know in the in crowd they felt they had to do that and I felt it so sad for them that and so they were instead of focusing on their education or just being happy with the the way they looked that's what they would spend their time doing and I used to see the way the boys would treat them so boys are taught to treat girls as if they are you know just objects and they would speak so rudely to them once some of a boy like getting a girl and literally shoving her like shoving onto the wall like nearly pulling her uh, mm. you know her, her blouse nearly tall and then I report and what really shocked me was how the girl just took it and then I reported him and and I spoke to him really harsh to say you don't treat girls like that but it was just out of one ear out of the other but that was normal behavior and um and I thought that's really sad that those girls, that's all that that's the like the path they're gonna follow because they have no alternative. And I know as Muslims it's we can sometimes feel um slightly apprehensive to sh tell people about our social system, our social rules. But if we do have friends, if we do have, you know, um like instead of for teenage girls, they should feel like very like confident that they when they're following Allah and they're obeying Allah's rules, that not only will make them more confident and, and have better self-esteem, they then can give that alternative to their friends who are feeling this pressure. And But at the moment, what's happening is our girls are feeling the pressure and then they're conforming to that very, you know, um, unhealthy, sexualized lifestyle. They're then following that. So I think it really, I hope, inshallah, that this book will like encourage other people to talk about this subject and not shy away from saying Islam yes we have the truth and this is our this is the truth you know it's not my truth it's the truth of Allah exactly. and the prophet exactly. and we they re we really need to convey that to them you know in an intelligent you know not in a I, what I don't like is um it's easy to look down you know on girls who you know they're not dressed correctly or they they have a boyfriend or they they've got into drugs or they're drinking you know there's all those things mm -hmm. i i do feel that those uh, they're looking for something to make them you know any kind of addiction is you get into that because you feel unhappy you know you don't know what else what alternative is there how else can i gain solace how can i where can i turn to to solve my problems and so if we can show you know young girls that actually islam can solve your problems you don't need to talk, turn to all those other you know um behaviors they ultimately will not help you because you'll reach a high and then you come down and then you feel even worse and you feel oh, i have to do this even more so it's but that that's uh, uncomfortable conversations that we're not having in the community exactly. and oh no alhamdulillah exactly. i'm sure i'm sure people are no that's arrogant of me to say they're not i'm sure they are happening well, i think they're I think... not happening enough and i think look, yeah, yeah. Bit, for example we have um ustad abu Ta abu taymiya i know he's been talking quite a lot and mm -hmm. highlighting a lot of these issues and there are some brothers online that, um i think he, the sunnah guy as well i've seen some things from him as well and definitely there's there's different um you know brothers in the community talking about certain issues but i think at the level um you know obviously for, for women and you know what you what you're doing for obviously for young girls with regards to this book 
and we need more sisters to actually be more kind of outspoken about certain things because I think when when you look at the communities on the base level um it's that sisters who are involved in a lot of, like things that are happening um is most of the time it's for sisters in general and not specific towards teenage girls and really kind of looking at where they're coming from and understanding the situation that is at the moment because and, and this is the problem there's there's a gap that is not being covered you know I think um it's like I remember being involved in some kind of um, some projects in the community and with the Islamic Centre in Newcastle and they used like every year they would have um youth sessions so you would have um like in the summer holidays for example a camp for boys camp for girls and it'd be like a week each where you know Know, they have kind of activities and you know kind of um lessons with obviously islamic um you know um teachings obviously framework in there and stuff like that for um for girls and for boys and the issue that we were facing really was that they, they the age range for boys was um ele- i think it was from 11 to 16 and for girls it was also 11 to 16 and i did mention to the brothers who were organizing the problem with the um the girls is that you cannot put girls age 11 to 16 in the same category and the reason why is that there's a divide in that in that age group you could have girls which for example we we would have often girls coming from the same family so their sisters for example and um you know maybe one sister would be 11 and the other one would be 16 the 16 year old does not want to do any activity that's related to the 11 year old whereas with the yeah. boys whereas with the boys you wouldn't have that problem they could be two boys the the 11 year old and the 16 year old it wouldn't be a big deal you know the boys would kind of just get on with it even if the brothers didn't want to do an activity together specifically it wouldn't be the same as with the girls literally it's like they didn't even want to be in the same like the the older sister wouldn't want to literally even be in the same room as her sister knowing that they're doing the same kind of activity do you see what I mean so it's like but I was saying for them, like they need to have like a more like a the tween kind of thing. So like for girls, they would have needed two groups, okay. but the community itself couldn't facilitate that because there weren't enough um volunteers in yeah yeah i totally get that activities so this is this was the problem that we was having so as a result um what would happen sometimes is that you know a lot of um some of the older girls would lose interest in joining because for them they they felt it as something like oh well, that's for that's for that's for little girls it's not for that's not for somebody my age kind of thing and then you know um so at the, but the, with the boys, that was like less of a challenge because boys in general, their activities are more, um, I don't know, you could say maybe a little bit more streamlined. They're kind of, you know, they, they, it's like, they, it's more basic. There's like, yeah, there's sports they're interested in. You can put them in the same class and talk about a subject. It's not going to be so much like, you know, they're definitely there's going to be certain things that obviously you could talk to older boys that's going to be facing them, whereas young boys, maybe they haven't experienced yet. But still with boys in general, it's, you know, there's a less of a divide in that age bracket than there is for girls in general, you know, and there's more like cohesiveness where they can get on and, you know, they mix very well together. But with girls, it just wasn't like that. So I think, you know, these are just some of the issues that, you know, and and in some families as well, like, you know, I remember when I was growing up, I mean, there's about four years difference between me and my sister, my younger sister. And so we grew up, you know, um, well, I was, I was a Christian, so we was got we were going to, going to church and things like that. And my parents always used to dress us the same, and it's like I don't know if you've noticed the difference now in the Muslim community, but that is not something that I don't think it, it Muslim parents can get away with doing at all now. Most parents can't get away with doing that at all now because they, you know, is dressing your children the same is almost like you know, oh, you're you. It's like it's part of them. You're stripping away the identity of your, you know, your children, or even giving like the hand me down clothing and things like that a lot of children now young people this is something that you know they despise being done you know so it's like this like you said there's such a big push towards individuality and you know identity specifically or you know you're free to do what you want and you know you have to live your life as you choose so this kind of individualism is affecting the children at a very you know grassroots level from a very young age and especially with the girls and you know where I like that you touched it on the story with the with the hair as well doing hair so even at the detriment to their own like um health 
they'll do things to themselves. So mm. almost like, you know, they, they, they believe that they're becoming uh, more individual, but the reality is they're becoming robotic. They're just doing something different to what their parents are, have encouraged, but they're going towards, you know, what has been pushed in, in the media and, you know, otherwise, and they're becoming almost like products themselves. They don't, they don't see it like that, but that is literally mm. what it is. They're turning themselves into a product because all these celebrities that we watch, um, you know, that we see on the screen, they are products. They are products selling yes. uh, an Absolutely. ideology. So when your children want this hairstyle or they want their hair cut like, you know, this actress or this, um, you know, um, singer or something like that, that's that's what they're doing. But for them, they see that as something like, oh, this is what's happening now. But the reality is, and, and it's, it's a problem. Like what came to my mind when you were talking about that story was just that, well, you know, the, the reaction from the, the from the boys and young men is that, you know, they're interested in products, whatever the product may be, whether it's a girl, whether it's, you know, a car, whatever it is. And we know as well, like for the longest time now, women have been used to advertise um, products that are geared towards men. So they, they themselves, as I said, they, they, they become part of the product themselves or products in and of themselves. That's how men start seeing women. And this is what is affecting relationships, um, in you know, um, because like you said the girls are uh, investing in you know these kind of boyfriend girlfriend relationships on a level where the boys are not because they're having to sacrifice a lot more of themselves and um, change mm. things about themselves which for them they think that that's going to get them something like this kind of prize or this this love or whatever it is appreciation which where the boys are really kind of not giving that and, and obviously as you mentioned there's other things where you know sometimes in rebellion towards that idea a girl will maybe think well oh the problem is the boy himself then men are like this and you know um yeah. you know, so so because men are misogynistic so then she'll become a lesbian for example or you know the gender identity thing where you know she decides she doesn't even want to be a girl anymore so oh i'm not a girl i'm a boy or i'm i'm neither you know and <laughs> subhanallah i've heard some things online which are beyond ridiculous um you know females saying things like i'm trigender so i'm 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 a male and I'm a female and, and I'm neither at the same time. It's just like, you know, never in our wildest dreams, you know, when we were in school, at times when, you know, a, a girl, if she was, you know, if somebody even suspected maybe she, that she was a lesbian or something like that, for example, it would be like, you know, it's it was still a taboo at those times, you know, like I'm talking like 20 years, 20 plus years ago when we were in school, like, you know, something like yeah. that, just like, you know, it was something taboo, was it? And if the girl, whether the girl was or not, it wasn't something she was going to, you know, flaunt proudly, you know, but now it's just like, you know, you, you've got people saying the most ridiculous things. So, subhanAllah, like, it's, it's incomprehensible to even think. And obviously, if this is this is how mental health has been, you know, it's, it's broken down to such a level now, like, we're in such a, a state where, you know, the mind has been... Um, you know, it shows how the mind can be manipulated to such a level where, subhanAllah, people can deny, like, what is actual reality. SubhanAllah, it's like looking in the mirror mm. and seeing yourself, but saying that it isn't yourself. Similar to when, you know, the days when we was in school, m most of the common problems, for example, um, with mental health and identity was anorexia or bulimia you know and that was a thing yes. where obviously you know that was you know even you know for for those of us who wasn't going through that um you know that fitna um when we knew girls who for example did have those issues we would think well how can she think that she's fat like look how skinny she is you know and we have the exactly mm. the same now you know but it's in the case but it's, it's with genders you know what I mean? So it's gone from literal one extreme to the next because, and I don't, it's like, it's you, you, you hear about things now with gender ideology and all this kind of stuff. You wonder what happened to bulimia and anorexia and if people are still actually suffering from those things. <laughs> nowadays, you know, it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's Allah. so it's like from frying pan to fire, but literally it's gone like beyond you know, and how do you even come back from that? Because obviously there's, you know, it's, it's, it's a real extremity where, you know, if, if these things are being um, almost, you can say nurtured, these thoughts are being nurtured in people, 
where they're encouraged to pursue these ideas you know in you know back in our time we would never you would never hear any doctor encouraging a girl to you know starve herself or to you know make herself vomit after eating these kind of things it was you know the opposite trying to get her as much help as possible or, or the or the boy as much help as possible to stop doing that to themselves because it was damaging themselves now young people are being encouraged to take hormones and cut off this body part and that body part so you know these are the things that you know muslim parents they need to be aware of they need to be talking to their children to check their mental health because partner you know and you know there's yeah. so many so many so many layers and so many things that could be causing you know the lead up to having these kind of issues you know it could be and, and i yeah. think a lot of it happens when there's a disconnect with the family but sometimes it's not even that sometimes it's just you know having a a, a very big influence from outside of the family or outside of the the community itself maybe somebody has managed to get to that child and um, you know kind of groom them into thinking in a particular way and um what reminds me of that as well is that um, even the case with that Shamima Begum which we had um you know the girl who who ran off to ISIS you would think like how is it that she managed to end up doing that you know um, sure. it, it, these are extreme cases and but it's not on un, it's not uncommon these are happening these are happening inside the homes of parents they don't know what their children are getting up to, subhanAllah. And there's some par some parents who have worked very hard in raising their children well and try to have connection with their kids and, you know, be there for them and give them that support. But still, subhanAllah, these are some of the fitness that, you know, we're being tested with in our time. So we shouldn't neglect, you know, just because we are even making our best efforts, we shouldn't neglect the fact that it's, it's still a possibility that, you know, these things could happen. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I completely agree I think yeah that parents just need to I hope you know inshallah that my, my book is just like a stepping stone to help parents yes. and girls to then you know one shine a light on the issues um and then get help about to to to, to change the situation because alhamdulillah we can all make mistakes <laughs> you know shaitan is constantly whispering but we have islam there to find a way through you know so even if some a teenager has like I saw I talk about whether it's drug addiction pornography having you know a relationship outside or you know before you're getting married these can all happen and they're happening so how can we help our girls to get through that and then you know you know get back on their feet as well inshallah 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 so um i would like to inshallah before we end or like just round up this interview if you could just briefly mention um the other books that you've written as well because i just think it's important for the listeners to know you know of the other things that you have put out there because mashallah you're doing a lot of work alhamdulillah it, for the community in this regard especially regarding um you know females and you know sisters now to you know how we can be better and smarter muslims and you do have you do have your podcast as well so if you could just briefly kind of summarize and um, those other things so that people are aware of them inshallah yeah so the other book that i've written is hands off our hijab and that was after the you know when france banned the wearing of um hijab for under 18s mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. that book really was to to really um each chapter goes through a different different aspect where Muslims are criticised about hijab. So the idea that, um, okay, the, firstly, to explain why did the ban happen, that, that was, and it's happening, and there's a chapter by a sister who lives in India, who she explains the bans that are happening in India. And then there's also the whole, looking at the whole concept of modest fashion and how um, the, you know, capitalist industry, you know, ec economy and has really taken our hijab and sexualized it and then they're selling it back to us and so we need to be aware of that like before we jump onto that bandwagon uh, and then there's also the we're told you don't even have to wear hijab it's not fair that doesn't say so in the quran you know there's that famous um, youtube ted talk by um a muslim woman who she she who has no she's has absolutely no islamic ridiculous. absolutely yeah. ridiculous. she can't, she Lina, can't Subhanallah, she can't even say the word Quran properly. So I don't know why anybody. <laughs> yeah. 
like subhanallah absolutely yeah. ridiculous she came she came with zero evidence at yes all. exactly and it's really so taking those different aspects and really just saying when you know don't take your understanding of hijab modesty um how to cover don't take it from these liberal non-muslims or muslims because they are not interested in in what the quran's done they really aren't absolutely so sister what about your other book you had i think a book about um uh questions about marriage or something like that oh yeah so then there's smart single muslimer which is for um but again it's for the, looking at the problem of why muslim women are finding it difficult to get married and so it's really looking at the ideas within our community but then also so for example in our community we've got racism we've got um the whole idea of nationalism you know there's certain things that are barriers that we have put in the way of getting married we're making it more difficult than alert and his messenger made to get married and this is so racism and um nationalism and then there's ageism as well mm -hmm. that they are th so I, I just discuss them because what can happen is if you don't have you know um if we don't have enough knowledge about our deen we can then think oh um you know being um when our say for example when parents say to their daughters oh you can only marry a pakistani yeah. they can think that comes from islam and what i wanted to because i wanted to say was no that's not from islam that is that is non-islam frankly that's some colonialism gave us our borders mm -hmm. that is something and you know the whole idea of age ageism again okay everyone can choose who they marry and what age but to say you know what age the, the point is once if someone's reached puberty once you know they're mature or they that's what islam says as far as getting married you know exactly. you need to know about Mm -hmm. so putting these caps on marriage or you know even the whole idea of divorce again that somehow if you get divorced you can't get married again yeah. or it's you don't want to marry a divorcee mm -hmm. again that's not from islam mm -hmm. so um but then there's also ideas such as you know um feminism which has had such a big impact on our views of marriage and unless a marriage is based on pure equality which doesn't even exist mm -hmm. that we're gonna we're being encouraged to reject the roles the husband and wife roles that Allah has given us mm -hmm. and so th so that was really to um you know and then there's this whole idea of men are trash that, yeah, that that's yeah. cut, that's like the hashtag that that has yeah. affected all women mm -hmm. so that was really for a woman who's finding it difficult or is thinking of getting married so something for her to read and think okay have I adopted or have my parents or adopted ideas that that is the reason why I'm finding it difficult and then we need to then kind of it's like we have to unlearn so much basically um so yeah so they were the two i also written a book on um child loss because um that was really uh what is that? my son passed away when he was 15 mm -hmm. and um that was really just to give help other parents who've gone mm -hmm. through the same situation as me because I, again what i found was there were many books written by christian women on the idea on the whole experience of child loss but again I want to show there's so many hadith and you know the prophet sallallahu he experienced this himself and I found so much solace it's the only thing that got me through it um and I thought let me just share that with my fellow parents and if it helped and I money from that goes towards um building wells in in drought areas in the Muslim world so that's something that was the first book I ever wrote and I've really um alhamdulillah really liked it was it really helped me mm -hmm. and that's what kind of got me into then writing my other books mm -hmm. alhamdulillah alhamdulillah barakallah sister so alhamdulillah definitely a big inspiration to me and um i'm sure an inspiration to a lot of the other sisters and i hope that inshallah sisters listening will feel encouraged to try to you know do more work in their communities as well as much as as much as they are able and you know nothing that you do sisters is too small you know anything that you can do for the sake of Allah even in a little if it's consistent inshallah you will be rewarded abundantly for it because we really are in desperate need of you know keeping our communities together as much as possible um you know and to follow the Quran and the Sunnah as much as possible inshallah because you know children and you know young people 
and even people at our age we're not we're not any better off necessarily you know we're still being affected all around from different things and if we're not aware and we close our eyes to the issues that are happening it's not going to help us because ignorance isn't bliss subhanallah you know that's what a lot of some some people they seem to think that you know that's going to help them but it really it doesn't so um uh, we're, uh, reminding the sisters who are listening inshallah um sister farhat's book is available on amazon rights and you also said google is it google play store uh google play books yeah so books, just right. type in smart teenage muslima and you'll find it inshallah okay and inshallah you mentioned also that's going to be available on the book depository also inshallah so please sisters yeah. check out sister farhat's books um, definitely beneficial and necessary alhamdulillah she's striving hard for the sake of Allah trying to you know do work in the community which is beneficial for us so let's make the most of it and also as I said we shouldn't stop there we have to try ourselves to also make our own um, effort and input but at the least we can do is support the sisters and brothers also who are doing the work already inshallah um, any final closing thoughts sister well, I'd just like to, let's, we need to do dua for the ummah, for our families, for our children. And yeah, really, I think you, what you said about supporting the work or the Islamic work of people who are speaking about these things, because as we all know, the the books, or even just, if we just say popular culture, it's the, the amount of funding they get to um, convey these ideas and promote these Islamic ideas to our youth. They, they weren't in the millions and so we we need to give support by doing the war that's the most important thing and then supporting whether it's through you know through buying the books leaving a review sharing it with your friends and family you know I um I also have a patreon page for the main that these are these are the ways that we'll because uh, everything takes time and effort and if we if some people could, don't have the time to write or to make videos but if you support the people who are then alhamdulillah you will share in the reward exactly. that, that's um alhamdulillah that that would be brilliant for you inshallah 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 barakallah fikum sister thank you so much for giving your time today it's been a pleasure talking to you again alhamdulillah i really benefited barakallah fikum Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, sister.